evening and welcome to another edition of Film Nut. I am your host, Jeff Schubert. Glad you can join us for tonight's show. To catch past episodes, you can go to the stream.tv slash Film Nut, and you can follow us on Twitter by going to at the Film Nut. When you think of the most memorable scenes in cinematic history, perhaps you think of movies such as The Godfather, Casablanca, or maybe even The Empire Strikes Back. But one scene that could crack the list has full nudity. And no, it's not that kind of nudity. You might be surprised by who was in it, unless, of course, you saw the comedy Borat, and then you know exactly what I'm talking about. My guest tonight is Ken Davidian, one of the unsuspecting sex symbols of Borat. Ken is an actor whose career continues to rise with roles in Get Smart and Meet the Spartans. He has guest starred on such shows as ER, The Ghost Whisperer, and Chuck. And he has four films coming out, including The Prankster, Melvin Smarty, The Artist, starring Malcolm McDowell and John Goodman, and You May Not Kiss the Bride, which also stars Rob Schneider, Kathy Bates, and David Annabelle. Ken Davidian, welcome to Film Nut. You're so, like, live right into the moment. I love it. Well, thanks, you know, and it's great because I love your work. You, so much of your work, you do great improv, you do great scripted, and we're going to talk about you know, both of those situations because I, I think you're fantastic and... We'll know more after tonight. After tonight, we will. <laughs> so, you know, I talked about the, the great fight scene. I was, in doing research, I found that that fight scene was nominated for an MTV Movie Award. How did it not win? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, believe me, I, I still hold a grudge. Uh, yeah. I, just because he's better looking, he had uh, uh, abs and he was just better looking. The scene from and, 300, of course, we're yeah. talking about that one. But it's like, that's forget that year. That's one of the best fight scenes in, in movie history. I thought so. Yeah. I got a hat from the stunt guy. There you go. He, came, he went, he left, the whole thing was over, and I was just sitting in the hotel room, dressed, and he came back and knocked on the door and said, I want to give you this because you did a great job uh, for a big guy with all these stunts. And I, I was very impressed, but we lost. There you go. But well, you, you, better luck on the next one. Now, I was doing a lot of research for you, and I saw in one interview, you were talking about um, how you'd always love to be in a Martin Scorsese movie and how you want to play a mob, tough guy, bad guy. And you may not kiss the bride. You do get to play a mob. A mob guy, yes. right? Head of Croatian mob. So uh, what is this movie about? And I know we've got a clip we're going to get to pretty, it's, pretty It's really a sweet love story. It's about me, who's a sweet, wonderful mobster, who tries to get his daughter to get papers to stay in the U.S. He needs, she needs a passport. And so I try to bribe the INS. It didn't work. And I've decided now the best idea is to marry her off to an unsuspecting little man named David Annabelle. And uh, they actually do fall in love, but there's a lot of action in the movie. I don't do anything mean or bad. Uh, the movie that I want to do is, is something that De Niro and Scorsese and, and uh, Pacino and uh, Pesci, I want to do one of those before, I, before the end of my days. Kind of like the Armenian Joe Pesci, maybe? I, 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 any way <laughs> that anyway. it would work. If they actually did this uh, Godfather 5 right. and they just wanted me to streak across right. naked, I would do that too. Just so you can say you were part of it. Yes. Well, you say you don't do anything mean. Let's take a look at a clip and see if that's true. Love your daughter. Nothing must happen on honeymoon. Well, then why are we even going on a honeymoon? INS must suspect nothing. The resort is far. Maybe they not far. Eyes will be watching you. So make sure that little Brian does not take over for big Brian. If you grab all I mean. Now, apparently, you and I have different definitions of uh, what's mean or not. Where have I seen that clutch and grab maneuver before? <laughs> Everybody who, you know, sends their daughter off wants to check and see how, uh, how endowed this person's going to be, right? So I just wanted to know if he can handle it. I think that could be your move, the clutch and grab. That, well, listen, you know, that, yeah, except <laughs> if it's a short guy, then I have a problem because right. I, I'm, I'm, see, tall guy like you, watch out. That's right, right. If you were a professional wrestler, that would be your thing. That would, that would be, that would be good. Now, in this movie, uh, you play the head of a Croatian mob family and you have an accent and, and the prankster, I believe your character is Greek. Is Greek, Greek right? yeah. So how do you go about learning these different dialects for movies and how authentic do the directors typically want you to be? 
they, they, they want you to be authentic. I mean, I, what I do is I will take the dialogue, then I have to find a couple of actual words in that nationality so I can learn the words. And when I start off, I'm, I always start off with one of those words that gets me going into that, that dialect because they're, they're all very close, but they're, they're, they're not. There, there's something different about each one of them. And, and a lot of the stuff that helps me is the, the, what I'm wearing, what other people are doing. There's a lot to, to come off with an accent. It's not, I mean, I can, if you want me to do it, it's not a problem. It just comes right away. That's not the difficult part. But the difficult part is putting the accent with the character and trying to make him whether he's uh, a, a mean guy or a lovable guy. Uh, did you... Take it upon yourself as a young actor to start learning dialects, or did you just start getting those types of auditions and you said, hey, it would be good for me to learn them? No, I'm Armenian. Mm -hmm. Everybody in my family talks like that. Okay. <laughs> we, again, the only people that don't talk like that are my children that, are, that were born here. Right. Everybody else, if you want to talk to them, you got to understand what the heck they're saying. Right. So, no, I, I learned it from a, a, when I was a kid, I used to entertain my family making fun of them. Right. Now, uh, the Artist with John Goodman and Malcolm McDowell, that, uh, when is, that's a, a film you're very excited about. Right? Yes. And I, that... I'm, I'm just excited to be in it. It was, it was uh, a, a, a great piece of work, and it was so touching when I read it. When I originally read the thing, I said, no, 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 no. I don't want the part they're offering me. I says, I want this part. And they said, well, I'm sorry, that's John Goodman's part. <laughs> and I says, what, what, what about this part? And I says, I'm sorry, that's James Cromwell's part. And that's McDowell's. I says, okay, if they're in the movie, I don't care what part you give me. And you said before we we came on that there was something very challenging for you in this movie. Yeah, it, it's the same challenge that I have here is to let you talk, <laughs> and I'm not good at that. So to be in a movie that actually had no talking, and to be able to express what I wanted to express in silence was very difficult. That's like, I'm, I'm an ad-libber. I like to get up and ad-lib and do my thing. And this one was completely no talking. Yeah, you, you were telling me you've been fortunate. You've worked on several projects where you've had the benefit of being able to ad-lib and the directors encouraged and liked it. How do you ad-lib with no talking? Right? I, it's very difficult. But you know what they finally did was they put, they, they cut the sound completely and said, okay, so go ahead, do it like you would do it in a regular movie, and, I, and that's what I did, and so uh, it, it, it looked really well, and I was just happy they kept it in the, in the uh, it was such a small part, I was happy they kept it in the, in the film. Right. Uh, Meet the Spartans, uh, that was another film where you got to do some improv -ing? Oh yeah, we did, we did, you know, the best thing you're looking for is a director that says, okay, let's do the script, and then you do your thing. And that was, that was like that. It was a lot of fun because I just went off. And what, was there a fun line in particular that you got to improv in that made it into the movie? Well, there was a lot of them. One of the things that I really, really liked was, wasn't even a line. I shot somebody. When I came uh, uh, stepping off of my uh, uh, giant thing that I was right. on, right, whatever the heck it's right. called, I, I came off and I stepped on everybody's back and then some guy missed and I just took my handgun out and shot him without looking at him, and it worked. And that was a, that was an ad lib. But we did a lot. We did a lot of ad libs. They kept some of them in there. They they didn't. I but I, I thought what was interesting for me was uh, Borat was right before that film, and Get Smart was after that film. And Borat, I was naked, and Meet the Spartans, I was half dressed. Right. And finally, in Get Smart, I was able to wear a suit. You were wearing a suit, but yet there's a scene where Steve Carell is basically humping you from behind, yes. for lack of yes, a better word. Is. Yes, he is. So, he, you know, you get that very action close like that. going again. He's trying to, basically, you're, you're knocked out. He's trying to, like, lift you up or whatever. It, you know, you're in that You know, I never room. thought of it. Do you think maybe I'm, like, a sex symbol? And, I, I and, think and these are. directors are, are seeing me as something more than I am? I, I, that's fine I, with me. I said Armenian Joe Pesci, but maybe Armenian Dennis Franz. You hey. know, Dennis went through it, that period yes, where they, they had to NYPD. show his butt in everything that he did. You, there's some kind of sexual innuendo in in a lot of your work. We, okay, we, shut the camera off. Let's try to work this out here. Let's, let's no, I, well, listen, if that's that, I, we all want to work. That's right. And if they want me naked, all they have to do is sign the check. Now, speaking of Get Smart, you were very funny in that. Um, but speaking of Get Smart, I, 
and Borat, I know for the Get Smart audition, uh, you went in in character kind of or, or with the accent and you almost no, I, didn't get the part I, because I, the director didn't know that you can speak clear English, is that they right? They wanted me to play burly guy and I didn't want to play just burly guy, but the reason they wanted me to play burly guy is because they didn't think they could handle me for an entire couple of weeks because I was a crazy old man that really didn't know where I was going or where I was supposed to stand, and I'm a foreigner. Right. So that's what he thought. And when he met me, he said, uh, Peter Siegel, he said, I know you speak English, but I didn't know you speak English. I said, yeah, man, this is me. I was born here. And uh, so then they invited me to a table read, and I did it in accent, and that's when I got the part. But when I met him, he was like, okay, I'm meeting you because I'm a nice guy, but I want you to play this thing with two lines, and you speak in a foreign accent. And so, and I wanted to play Starker because I had, I grew up watching Get Smart, and I, that's the part I knew that was great for me. So it worked out. Does that... Um, perception of you maybe as being foreign speaking, does that ever get frustrating that, I mean, you're as American as me, as yes, Brian, yes. Grimaud it, in the it booth still there. happens Hi, Brian, now. how you doing? <laughs> it still happens now. It, it, I met uh, 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 the writer of Joe, uh, Meet Joe Black last night. We had dinner together. Uh, his name's Ron Osborne. I didn't know you speak English. Yeah. Yeah, I speak English. So uh, yeah, sometimes it has. I remember after Borat, I went to a meeting at Disney. And, I, and I've said this story before, so if you've heard it, I'm sorry. Uh, I went to a meeting at Disney, and all these executives are sitting in front of me, and they're going, please sit down. We'll be right with you. I said, what, 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 what are you talking about? Well, do you understand us? Yeah, and, I, and believe it or not, the poster of Holes was in that office. And I said, you see the poster? I was in the movie. Oh, and uh, all of a sudden it, it broke the ice, but it was like all these people wanted to come and see this crazy old man. Right. Uh, you got into acting at a young age, correct? Yes, oh, yes, we... I was a theater arts major in college. I did it in high school, junior high, every minute I could. Now, were you always kind of, see, I'm not a big fan of um, the character actor term, I had Robert Davi, on one time and I said to him, you know, either you can act or you can't. Character actors is, is more of a description of someone's physical appearance, I think, than it is their acting ability. Because if you can act, you can act. You can play anything, right? Yes, but I think the difference is that some people have put the leading man mm -hmm. versus the character actor. And the leading man is changing. Now our, our leading man, who's, who is probably going to be the next love interest in another movie is Steve Carell. So that, that is changing. Uh, but character actor is everything who's not the, the guy who's That's the girl's right. madly in love with. Now, when you were first getting into acting, did you see yourself as a character actor right away? Did Because uh, a lot of young actors in their teens, early 20s, you know, they, everyone wants to play the, the stud or the leading guy or what, or what have you. How, how did you see yourself and how did you pick your path or pursue your path? Uh, I was short, fat, and ugly all the time. <laughs> so I knew right away that I was going to go under that character actor thing. The, the first college performance I did, uh, I played uh, Golden, in Golden Boy. I didn't get Golden Boy. I played his father. And the guy that played Golden Boy was uh, uh, two years younger than me. So I always knew that was it. And that's fine with me. I don't really believe that because if it's not if you don't have these people around you you're just doing a monologue or you're alone now uh, you're you starred and produced a short film that your son wrote correct yes yeah. and th what made me think of it is because you said you've been short fat and ugly your whole life yes well he doesn't refer to you as short but your son writes the dialogue in fat and hairy yes right? that's very interesting <laughs> yeah. that you should bring that up but that he sees you that way yes but he that, sees me that way a lot <laughs> that's right. that was uh, now did he make you audition or did he how did that go you know, I'm surprised he didn't. Right. He did everything else. I remember one time he actually stopped the shooting right. because I said, I ad-libbed, and that's what I do. And I ad-libbed and I said, I hope the kid doesn't croak. And the word was, uh, die. And he stopped the shoot and said, come here, come here, come here. It's die. And I went, okay. But you know, you know how writers are. That's right. It's, 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 it's a well, different breed. Uh, we'll set up a little bit more about this. It's a, it's a short film. You're starring in it. John Lovitz is in it. You you allegedly play yourself. I hope that's not the real you. <laughs> uh, you. You don't think that the kid knew the real me to write it? I, I, he's got it almost like 
Right on. And it's uh, you set up. You play yourself, and it's about a, a, a dying child, right? Yes, it's about a child who his last day he wants to spend with character actor Ken Davidian. And uh, he thinks we're going to go to the studio and we're going to go to, we would come here. And there's a lot of other stuff that he wants to do. And what happens is he ends up with me, who ends up taking him to the infield, which is our hot dog stand that we own, uh, buying weed from John Lovett. I heard that was uh, like a contract demand that your manager made. If you were going to do it, you had to have a little product placement of your sandwich Yes, shop. yes. <laughs> well, see, he works at the store. The okay. two sons run the store. Right. They, did, they didn't care about me. They're, right. they're just plugging their own store. Right. Uh, and I asked John to do a favor. And to tell you the truth, he didn't know that he was going to be selling me weed. He had no idea. All he said while he was chewing on a hot dog was, yeah, okay, what time do you want me to be where? That's all. And he came, and I says, okay, now you're selling me weed. And he went, okay, ter terrific. I'm, I'm, I'm making it worse on my life. I, I, so he was very gracious and very nice. Well, it's uh, Last Day Foundation, if anyone wants to look it up on YouTube. Yeah. It's, I, I, I even thought it was, you know, edgy funny. Right. And, and it worked. It's, it's very funny. And I'm doing another short with uh, uh, another young Armenian writer, and I, I like doing the stuff that you don't have to do. Right. I like, you don't, now, thank you, God, you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. You can do what you want. And some of these things are, are a lot of fun because you're bringing up kids that have not, you know, they're just trying to crack into it. And I wish I had help when I was their age. Right. Um, now, your son, so you say you're writing other things with your son. Is, yes. Does is, is he want to be a writer, director, producer? And what's your advice to him as he gets started? My advice to him is always been keep going, keep going, don't stop. We write something and we'll get on to something else. We keep going. I, I'm, we've got like six different projects that we're working on from a cartoon to a, a movie that we're putting together to do. I hope two, three of them see the light of day. It's just, you know, you've got to keep doing something. And I like now the producing end of it. I like it. It's, it's, it's like business, and it, you have to put this together with this, and you have to do that, and you have to get this guy to agree to that, and I, I like doing that. Do you feel like it gives you an opportunity to step out and maybe pursue roles that other casting or producers wouldn't necessarily see you as? It does. It does. It does, and also you have more creativity, and you can, well, unless your son's writing it, then you don't have <laughs> nothing. Uh, but you have more creativity and you can say what you really think. I mean, when you're on a $100 million movie, you're working for somebody. You do, you know, what you're told. I'm from the old school. I think the director is the, is the god and this is the guy that I listen to and he tells me what to do. But if you're producing it and you're involved in it, you can throw your own two cents in. So if you're a control freak like I am... You want to do that. You get an opportunity to take the ring. So what would be uh, your ideal part that you would produce for yourself? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think it would be something in, in the lines of, of uh, being real, but something that ha would have to do with uh, Armenian community, Armenian history. Uh, uh, I would like to get one of the Schindler List type of movie done before all this is over. That's on my bucket list. That would be an outstanding piece of work to do, and I sincerely wish you all the luck in the world getting that done. Thank you. Um, another project you have coming out soon is uh, The Prankster. Yes, yes. So uh, tell the audience a little bit about that, and then we'll take a look at a clip from that. That was a, another really cute romantic film uh, the guy ends up falling in love, but he's a prankster in high school, and now he's decided that he wants to mature and go to college where I want him to stay home and work with me, but that's what every dad wants. They don't want you to go away. They want you to stay home. And it's the conflict between father and son, and eventually he ends up going to college, and uh, stop, he stops becoming a prankster, and he becomes an adult. It's, a, it's a, uh, one of these stand-by-me films, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And everybody that I did the film with, I'm still friends with, and they're all working, and they're all young kids, and I, like, I, I actually like hanging around and being with this young generation. That's great. Well, you seem like one of the guys. And Thank I'm only you. sitting with you for a little bit. Let's take a look. I'm sorry, Dad. For what? For getting in trouble, for you having to go down there. 
You really sure that uh, Joker the Dean fooling around with a woman? Oh yeah, we heard him messing around backstage. Badass naked. Ah, uh, he was well on his way. <laughs> I would do a job half price to see that. <laughs> well, uh, wait, listen, I want to talk to you. You know, maybe I haven't been a good father. No, it's okay, Dad. No, 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 no. Listen to me. I want you to know I'm proud of you. For what? For doing good in school and, and holding a job. And for growing up without a mother. And putting up with me. That's not easy, I'm sure. It's fine. And one more thing. What? For showing that Joker the Dean bare ass naked. <laughs> So if you're not actually naked, you're talking about being I, naked. I, I, listen, I think, I think I'm a sex symbol. <laughs> you are. I tell you, what I really liked about that clip was um, you really danced back and forth very nicely between the, the dramatic and the comedic. Thank you. I, I try. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's the same thing I would have said to my own kids. So that's how uh, I relate to this stuff. A lot of this stuff is, is something that you would do with your own family. And I like that realism. Do you do a lot of uh, what they, I guess they call in the acting world substitution? We, we were talking about the Borat scene before we came on live, and, and you were saying you had a relative that would actually run around a place naked, you know, and, and you kind of use that to help you yes. get in. And that. Yeah, I, I, I always do that. I, I always uh, try, to, try to make it to something where I understand it and I can relate to it, and hopefully the audience will relate to it. Okay, let's get to some questions in the chat room. Fa would like to ask, what is Ken's favorite French dip sandwich? Uh, I gotta tell you, the pastrami. The pastrami is my favorite. Uh, we, we start from scratch with the pastrami. Now when you say we, for people who don't know, you have. I have right now, uh, we used to have a place called The Dip and The Infield. Now we have The Infield only. It's on the corner of Ventura Boulevard and uh, Beverly Glen in Sherman Oaks. And it's an outdoor hot dog stand with every kind of hot dog you could think of, plus the pastrami sandwich, because we need the pastrami for the pastrami dog, so we kept the sandwich. And we've got stadium seating from Dodger Stadium, Angel Stadium, uh, uh, Chicago, everywhere. And it's really a cute place where you can get a hamburger, I mean a hot dog, any way you want it, from a Twinkie dog to a chili dog. And about three months ago, Charlie Sheen came and he created his own hot dog and then he tweeted it to over a million people. So it's been going great. And your favorite? My, my favorite is a hot dog called the West Virginia, which is uh, the chili on the bottom, the hot dog, which is a, a classic one that pops, right. uh, and it has to be steamed, right. and then coleslaw on top. Very nice. Let's get to another question. Cupcake would like to ask, working with movies and TVs, which form of visual media do you enjoy working on? Is it filming for an hour show or TV or a feature length film? The, the difference between the feature length film and a half hour show or an hour show is the time. And with the feature, you can play, you can ad lib, you can, you can do, you can make things better. And then if they don't like it, they cut it out in the editing room. But on television for, for episodic and, and 24 minutes that you get for a sitcom, it's a movement thing. You gotta be fast, you gotta, you, you know, you, you stick to the lines. Now, and the, it's more difficult for me. Is that as true, forget TV and film, compare big budget studio film versus indie film? 10 pages a day versus one or two pages a day, right? Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it's more fun to do the 10 pages. Obviously, you get paid better with the two pages, uh, and more people see it. There's so many films that, that never get the, the light of day, but that's all of because of the rest of the part of the business. The actual making of the film is, is it's a pretty good film. It just doesn't get out there. But I, do, I don't mind. I like either one. I like, it's a director's thing. It's, it's if you can work with the director, then you can, it doesn't matter if you're doing one or two pages, if he likes the way you work. I mean, nobody tells Robin Williams, hey, bring it down, quiet down. <laughs> uh, or if they do, I'd like to see what he was well, before that direction, yeah. right? Yeah, um, so. I, 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 like, I like to be, and I like doing it by the script. I like going by the script because I want to give that guy in the editing room the option to do either way. The difficult part is when the writer and the director is the same thing. Then you've got, you didn't say 
the. Okay. So but, now, and you do it. You, you do because he's the captain of the ship, so you do whatever the heck he wants. So it's what, two of the films we're talking about tonight were the same writer as director, correct? Uh, uh, one of them, uh, I, think, I know. Pri uh, uh, oh, no, Prankster, yes. Prankster is, and so is uh, uh, You May Not Kiss the Bride. Right. So, yeah, so there, the writer's on set every second of your yes, delivery. Yes, yes. Is, is that one it, of the big it, differences? It, it's very hard to, to, when you're, I mean, I know people that even when they do an interview or something, they're very quiet, and they're, I, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a bull in a china shop. That's fair enough. Uh, Nimble Rider would like to ask, uh, what was your career like before Borat? How did you get the part, and how did it change your career? Wow, that's one big question. <laughs> okay, what was life before Borat? Uh, working hard, like an actor, like a regular guy, and we're still doing the same thing. Go to auditions, or now they're meetings, uh, and meet with people and try to explain to them why you think their project is good, so they'll hire you. Uh, but before that, it was just, you know, knock on doors, auditions. I was always the guy that went to the agent and said, call for this, call for that. And it was the same thing for Borat. It was call, 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 and they wouldn't let me in. They, they said, no, we don't want you. You're an American actor. We don't want an American actor. Now, what did Larry Charles say to you? Larry Charles called me a fraud because... And we have, I, I, I don't know if you have the clip, uh, we, he taped the audition. And when I went in there, I was completely in character. I was wearing a suit that belonged to me that you see in the film, but I was 100 pounds heavier. So it was very baggy on me. And I had an 8 by 10 folded up in my pocket that I took out and I straightened up and I gave to them. And when we got up, we started doing uh, ad libs with uh, Sasha. And they asked me, they said, can you ad lib? And I said, what do you mean ad lib? One, two, three? No, 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 no. Can you do improvisation? And I said, oh, improvisation. I take it in classes. And I heard everybody going, he's taking classes? What is he doing here? How did he get across the gate? And I thought, okay, I got him. I'm, I'm, I, I, even if I don't get the part, I have successfully convinced these people that I have no business here. And that's what they were looking for. Right. But wasn't there a, a story with Larry where you almost got on an episode of Seinfeld? Oh, yes. You know, he, he told me, he said, well, let me finish the other one because he yeah. didn't call me a fraud. It wasn't a bad thing. Right. When I finished the audition, I was walking out and I thought, well, somebody's got to tell them. And I turned around and I said, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, if you like the audition, please give me a call. And that's when he jumped up. He goes, you're a fraud. <laughs> so but he had told me while we were on while we were working, uh, he, I had told him about an audition that came to me from Seinfeld, and it was about a Russian guy eating a muffin in a bus, and I couldn't go. I was in Mexico at the time, and I didn't get the part, and I had told him about it, and he said, if you had gotten that part, you would never be in Borat, because I would have known you were, not a, not, you were an actor at the time, because they were looking for somebody that wasn't. I think that was the episode where Kramer's giving people the Jay Peterman tour. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the bus. That's right. There you go, and, Seinfeld guy. And Elaine uh, was making the twist-off muffin tops, yes. and Kramer was taking the bag. Okay, sorry for the little Seinfeld moment. That's right. Uh, let's see. Chum Lodio, how much of the famous rustling scene in Borat was planned out versus how much did you just roll with it, uh, so to speak? Now, I know in Borat... Roll with it? Yeah. <laughs> Roll with it, that's what you want. It's a very good word. So I know on board a lot of it was improv, um, but in that specific scene, how much did you plan out? Did you block, do the any only, kind of rehearsing? The only thing that had any blocking was in the, 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 the hotel room, we had a, a stunt man who was there and telling us which way to go and where to go. And we had the, the mirror was a stunt mirror. The, the lamp was a stunt mirror. The television was not. I, we, we, and we used the camera. I actually took the camera off the camera guy and threw it into Sasha. That was about a half a day. But the rest of it was all improv at that time. Uh, the scene in the elevator, if you look at the scene in the elevator, there's a part where he actually grabs my hand and brings me and puts me next to him because we ended up on different sides and we've only got one camera guy inside. So if you want to get the two shot, you got to be standing together. So uh, it was all, it was all, one kid came up to me at the infield and he ordered and he started laughing. And I said, oh, you're laughing at, he says, I've seen you naked. 
And I thought, oh, you saw the screening of the film or something. He says, no, my father was a broker. He was the guy giving the speech when you ran in. I said, okay, well, hot dog's on me, kid. <laughs> That's great. You know, to be a great actor, there's a lot of skills you need. One of them, of course, is to be uninhibited. I can't imagine a more uninhibited scene than that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. It was hard to explain. <laughs> uh, Ken Yoshi would like to ask, what does Ken like to do in his free time? The mother of my children, that's all. I like spending time with her. I like going places with her. I, 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 I enjoy her company. And now that I'm working so much, I have less time with the family. And that's, that, that, that's bothersome. Because we I really like the family uh, outings and stuff. But now the kids are, they're not kids anymore. Right. So. Well, and it sounds like um, you're doing some writing and producing with Aaron, right? Your son. Yes, yes. We're, that's one of the ways I'm, I'm still it together, dad. Yeah, right? yeah. So, it's a great feeling, and I, 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 I like uh, the family atmosphere. Now, you do a lot of, you still do a lot of guest star TV work. We, we talked yeah. about that, right? How has that changed in terms of with more and more content going from TV to the Internet? Has that affected... Um, the money that you make or how I know there was a big concern the last time there was an agreement between SAG and the AMPTP about the content moving over. Has that affected you at all? Or because you you know, you're up the ladder, you're making more than the minimums anyway. So it doesn't. Yeah. But you know what? It's, it's not just about me. There's, there's the, the, the thing that I like about it the most is it's given so many people a chance, you know, it's like a giant, uh, uh, American idol and, and, if you are really good at your craft and you can do something, you now have a a way to get it out and have people see it. Like so you host an internet show. Yes, right. <laughs> you can do that. Yes. And hopefully it'll be on TV. That's right. But but it's great. It's just one more stage for people to be on to get to where they want to go. I, I think it's it's going to be uh, uh, the leading place where you're going to watch t television and movies. And I was involved in that contract thing, and I'm 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 happy it's it's going further. And I think it's the next phase to come. I do everything on my phone. I do Twitter now on my phone. That's right. Follow me on Twitter. I do Twitter. I do Facebook. And it was all because studio said, "Hey, you have to become uh, socially uh, involved in the social media." And so I said, okay. So I've got an app where I can talk into the phone. I don't have to type. So I can talk. So it's like giving dictation. Now, to alleviate the stress of your publicist in the back room, follow him on Twitter at the real Ken Davidian. Not the, it's just real Ken Davidian. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I don't know, there was four f different Facebooks. We had to, we we're still trying to shut them down and put the, the main Facebook because I've got, a couple thousand friends, but they're all in different Facebooks. Right. And so now we're trying to consolidate it. But at, at one time I thought, okay, I, this is not my thing. I'm too old to have to care about the computer, but you do. That's right, you do. Let's see, Veggs would like to ask, Ken's numerous roles, which does he feel was the hardest for him to prepare for? Oh, listen, when you're, when you're working on somebody's film and they've spent Thirty, forty million dollars to get you to this point. Uh, they're all hard. Even if somebody has spent a hundred thousand dollars to do a small film, you're you're actually working with somebody's baby. They're, they they've created this thing, and so it's all hard. You can't. I don't think. Is there, can, is there a scene that was particularly hard, uh, or, or is there a running scene? around naked wasn't the simplest thing wasn't in the, the world? Simplest. Aside from the running around naked, what was the scene that took the most time to shoot? In any movie? Any movie. Well, well it was, it was the, a really long, complicated A, a, a lot of the, the Pratt stuff, you know, where you, you, you fall down and that kind of stuff, that scene that you were talking about with Carell, uh, that, that took a half a day, and partly because I'm a, a, an actor who likes the realism. So when he was holding me, I went completely limp. Now, this poor guy's trying to keep up 300 pounds, so after he did the eye thing, he just dropped me. And I went and cut my head, and, and it was bleeding, and they came up, and, you know, how many fingers do you see? And, you know, I'm not going to say two fingers. I said, I see six fingers. Right. They asked me who the president was. I said, Kennedy, and they freaked out. They thought, whoa, something's wrong with the guy. But a lot of that stuff takes a lot of time. The hardest part 
is, and I like to, to memorize all of the dialogue, only because you cannot ad lib unless you know everything. I mean, you need a backstory. You need a lot more to ad lib than if you're just reading it off the page. And because you also have to bring it back someplace. Yes, right? you have so to bring it back so, so that so the other guy know. can keep going. Right, exactly. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time uh, in my trailer reading the lines, and then you know, ad libs don't come like just like that. That that's you have to set them up in your head. You you have three or four different ad libs. You say one, and if it's funny one, then that's the one you keep. And sometimes you can do all four of them and people are going, <laughs> and you know, you're not funny. Between the scene with you and, and the dance scene that Steve had, he, he had his work come out. Cut oh out yeah, for him. he <laughs> did. He had, a, he had, he was, this was a good athletic film for him. That's right. Uh, Chester 101, do you have any plans to write or produce a movie so you can have more control over the role you play? Well, we kind of already covered that. Um, is there anything specific that's that's got like the best chance of happening or oh there's 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 three or four sitcoms one's called you can call me al mm -hmm. and al is a story of a guy who got arrested uh accidentally and taken to uh, uh, a detention camp and he finds out that it's a retirement community and he wants to stay there and he loves it and uh, so he doesn't want to leave. There's another one called Barda which is a spy thing. There's a couple of movies that we're doing uh, and yeah, creative control is part of it, but it's also, you, you just want to keep doing stuff. You know, it, it, it's not good to like sit and relax in this business. You've got you've to be pushing. Right, well that's a theme you hit on twice and I, I want to hammer it a third time. Right, staying proactive, staying productive, finding ways to be creative, uh, doing something to enhance yourself creatively every day, um, of working on the business aspect, but you always have to be proactive and productive, right? All the time, all the time. And people keep saying show, and my son tells me very often, it's show business. It's a business. It's got to make money. It's got to work. It's got to be uh, uh, set up. You can't just go out there and say, okay, I'm going to say a few lines. Right. You gotta, you, you're dealing with somebody's money. Somebody's put up $100 million, $50 million, or $100,000, and that to them, whatever it is, it's yeah, to them. It's it, it, yeah. it's a big deal to them. Absolutely. So, uh, but yes, I want to do more more production. Okay. I like it. Now, a question we like to ask everyone before we let them out of here is: Do you have a favorite set speak term? Yes, yes. Do you care to share it with us? <laughs> yes, it, it it's it's called action, action. I love hearing it. I love it. I have a uh, 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 it's orgasmic. Honest to God then you know you're on the set, you know you're working, and you know it's time for you to be on. And I'm on all the time, but when I hear the word action, I, I fall into place. I love it. That's a great answer. I love it too. Very nicely done. So I want to go over now for The Prankster. We've got a website for The Prankster. It's uh, theprankstermovie.com, correct? Yes, and that should be coming out uh, on Stars and... Uh, Netflix, uh, I believe. Netflix, uh, sometime next year. Early 2012. Uh, early 2012. And... Uh, the Artist. The Artist is coming out in November. So look for that. And, that, and that did well at Cannes, right? Yes, it was the first film sold in con this right. season okay. and it was uh it's black and white set in 1928 or something and it was it's it's really an awesome film and you may not kiss the bride I that one we're working on distribution i'm actually part of the the team that's uh, uh trying to get distribution and we've got this great cast kathy uh kathy bates Catherine mcphee david annabelle uh vinnie jones uh me uh, so it's it's a great. And uh, I think it had a nice premiere and a good review at the Sonoma Film Festival. Yes, it did. It did. So now we're we're you, because see that's the business part of this thing. You can't just go and do your thing and then go home. We've got to get distribution. There's a lot to making a movie than just going and saying a few lines. Absolutely. Well, Ken, it's been great talking to you. Thank you. Is the hour up already? It goes by, doesn't well, it? It sure does. Okay. Well, again. Much luck with everything you've got going on. Thank you. Thank you. That is going to do it for this edition of Film Nut. If you came in late, you can catch this and all episodes of Film Nut on demand by going to the stream.tv slash Film Nut. This one should be up by tomorrow. Once again, I would like to thank my guest, Ken Davidian, and all the viewers for surfing in and asking great questions. See you next time on Film Nut.